Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see so many people here. Could you please take your seats? We'd like to get started shortly. This event is being live streamed, so our at-home audience is waiting for us to begin. There are some reserved seats up front for our special guests. Our benefactors, our speakers. I'm going to give it one more minute because it looks like we have four people trying to check in, but otherwise, we will get started shortly. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Beth Angel, Dean of the University of Michigan School of Social Work, and I am thrilled to welcome all of you, both those of you who are here with us in person, as well as a number of participants online, for the School of Social Work's second annual Social Justice Changemaker Lecture with Darren Walker. This lecture is made possible by the generous support of the Hawkins family, who are sitting here in the front row. The Hawkins family established this series with the goal of bringing change makers to campus to inspire our students, faculty, and community. Neil and Anne Marie and Rachel, thank you so much for your generous support. We've also received support from a number of co-sponsoring units from all across the university um, who have worked with us to make this program possible, and all of those are listed in your program. So thank you to our co-sponsors as well. And finally, I would like to thank our wonderful planning committee and our incredible team from the School of Social Work for all of their hard work on this event. Just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. This event is being recorded. And after the event, uh, a reception right here in the ballroom will follow. So I hope all of you will be able to stay and join us. Um, and now I would like to introduce um, Provost Laurie McCauley, um, who will make some brief remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Angel. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. What a wonderful day on the Ann Arbor campus. Those of you who are in the room, I hope you had the pleasure of walking across campus like I did to see the vibrance um, of our student population here in the fall term, third week. Well, this is my first official event with Dean Angel, although um, I've had a chance to interact with her numerous times. She has been really wonderfully present uh, on campus for numerous events, but uh, it's my pleasure to officially welcome you here to the University of Michigan community and to lead the number one school of social work. So thank you. <laughs> I also want to share my thanks to the Hawkins family uh, for making today's conversation possible. Thank you so much. Your support for the social justice 
Changemaker Lecture Series enables us to bring prominent social justice experts and advocates from multiple disciplines to the University of Michigan campus. We are so thankful for your continued support of Michigan social work, which as we know is just one facet of your wide ranging support across our campus. Thank you. This university has a strong history of social activism. On the steps of this very building at 2 a.m. on October 14, 1960, John F. Kennedy challenged University of Michigan students to devote a few years working in developing countries across the world to promote understanding of those countries and the United States. In the following weeks, U of M students rallied, signing a petition to establish the Peace Corps. Today, the U of M is one of the top five universities providing Peace Corps volunteers. Our students embrace a challenge to commit to social activism. Here in the School of Social Work, students and faculty have led the university in prioritizing social justice for over a century. The school is well positioned to lead us in today's discussion. Social workers use research, advocacy, and leadership skills to produce change and societal cohesion. Social workers listen and understand the needs of individuals and groups. They help develop the resources that our communities desperately need. And social workers bring their hearts and minds to affect systemic change in the pursuit of social justice. Today, we continue that tradition of using bold ideas to create change. Thank you, Social Work, for hosting this really very important discussion. I look forward to listening to our speaker. Thank you so much, Provost McCauley. I now have the honor of introducing Darren Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation, who will address today's topic, social change in action. Now, Darren requested that we not give a long bio in, 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 his, in his introduction, but you can read about his, his path and his many accomplishments in your program. And I'm going to then simply say this, um, that Darren doesn't just no social change in action, he's lived it. Raised by a single mom in Texas, Darren was in the first preschool class of Head Start, which at that time was a brand new federal program aimed at reducing poverty. He received an excellent public school and university of education at the University of Texas, Austin, Hookham, and went on to work at, on Wall Street before turning to philanthropy and he's led the Ford Foundation for nearly 10 years, since 2013. One of my favorite quotes from Darren Walker is, hope is oxygen. Social workers understand this in our bones because hope is the center of all we do. And hope is even more crucial in challenging times, challenging times like we face today. And so I'm thrilled now uh, to bring some of, some of that hope and challenging times and how to stay grounded um, into our conversation today. And um, I'm thrilled to welcome Darren Walker to the University of Michigan. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Dean Angel and Provost McCauley and the very generous Hawkins family, thank you for making this occasion possible. It is a beautiful day in Ann Arbor, Michigan. What a magical place this great university called the University of Michigan is. To come on to this campus, which is enchanting, with students and faculty from around the globe, all here committed to learning, advancing ideas, 
and engaging in the process of democracy making. I'm especially grateful as the president of the Ford Foundation to have one of my trustees, Henry Ford III and his mother, Cynthia, with us. Because I wouldn't be here today were it not for the Ford Foundation. So before I talk about the intersection of social change, justice, and philanthropy, I do want to acknowledge that the Ford family, and specifically Henry and Edsel Ford, created the institution we know of it as the Ford Foundation. It started with a $25,000 check written by Edsel Ford in 1936. And Edsel Ford sadly, tragically died at a young age. A significant amount of his estate was transferred to the Ford Foundation. And that today is the constitution of the $18 billion endowment that we use as our corpus. Edsel Ford especially was a remarkable man, an innovator, an entrepreneur, someone who loved the arts. His father, Henry Ford, was also an interesting man, a very complicated man. Of course, he is known for some of the unfortunate positions he took. But I like to remember and remind people that Henry Ford was the first industrialist to name inequality as a problem in America. And it is why he chose and made the decision to increase the pay of his frontline workers in the factories. And so today, as the Ford Foundation works on issues of inequality, I believe that our mission is indeed rooted in the very earliest work and mission of the Ford Foundation and Henry Ford himself. Now, philanthropy and social change and justice. I've had the great privilege of working first at the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation today, two gold standard legacy foundations rooted in Andrew Carnegie's ideas that were espoused and articulated in his very well-known Gospel of Wealth essay written in 1889, which is the foundational document of American philanthropy. Every philanthropist from Frick and Carnegie to Rockefeller and Mellon and Bloomberg and Gates have used this document as foundational to their work. And in it, Carnegie talked about generosity. He talked about charity. And he made the case for why men like himself needed to give back. And it really instantiated in our culture this idea of giving back. Now, Carnegie had no issue with inequality. He said that inequality was simply a natural phenomenon and that the question was what wealthy men like him and Frick and Rockefeller should do with their God-given talent that made it possible for them to accumulate such wealth. And that really is, uh, for so many people, how philanthropy is viewed. And it is necessary for there to be charity and generosity. But I came across a very obscure speech that Martin Luther King 
gave in 1968, just a few months before he was assassinated. And about philanthropy, he said the following. Philanthropy is commendable, but it should not allow the philanthropist to overlook the economic injustice which makes philanthropy necessary. And so what Dr. King was saying was something different to the philanthropist than Carnegie said. Dr. King was challenging the philanthropist to get uncomfortable and to excavate and interrogate their own complicity in the very problems they are now seeking to solve. And so it was from that document that the idea of um, a little book that I wrote, From Generosity to Justice, emerged. And it was how do we think about philanthropy as a means for social justice when, in fact, philanthropy is often created from systems of inequality and injustice. And it's that engagement that we are involved in at the Ford Foundation, engaged in excavating our own complicity, our own responsibility in our investments so that we hopefully are not doing harm and in our operations, in the way in which we make grants, to whom we give grants. And that work is not easy because you have to hold the mirror up to yourselves. And the thing about philanthropy and wealth and privilege is that it's supposed to buy you the right not to have to do that. Right? That's the notion of what privilege is, is that it gives the possessor of that privilege the currency to simply say, I don't have to deal with that. Or that may be a problem for other people who don't have my privilege. And so I think for real social change to happen, we in philanthropy have to commit ourselves to the idea of justice and the idea of social progress. And that's the work that we've undertaken at Ford. I think we are far, far from um, executing uh, well as I'd like, but we are on the journey. And occasions like this, um, I hope we'll have a chance for questions um, help me as I learn and continue to learn every day. And I learn most um, from hearing from smart, talented, committed people like you. And I look forward to that. Thank you, Dean Angel, for this wonderful invitation. Thank you, Darren, for sharing your... Thank you for sharing um, some of your journey uh, to the presidency of the Ford Foundation with us. And what I will do now, just for the benefit of our audience, um, is that we will um, hold, hold a conversation here on the stage, and we will be drawing on questions that were submitted ahead of time by members of our audience, which includes students, faculty, staff, and alumni. And so for those, of you, for those of you in the audience, we will actually not be taking live questions, so I wanted to clarify that. Um, but we do invite you to stay for the reception following the event so that you can share some of your reflections with others um, in, in discussion. Um, so we will now turn on our Um, I'd love to begin by talking a bit and maybe building on some of your remarks about high-impact philanthropy and its relationship to social justice. 
You've led the way in creating a new vision of philanthropy fitted to the circumstances of the 21st century. And you, you talked a little bit in your remarks about your book, and I know that that's where you unpacked um, some of those ideas. Can you talk with us about your vision for how the Ford Foundation seeks to affect social change and what you see as the role of philanthropy in fostering social justice in today's society? Well, at the foundation, a major focus for us uh, is the issue of inequality. And when we started on this journey almost 10 years ago, and for the first time really uh, organized all of the foundation's work around one thematic area, it was because our mission includes the uh, remit of uh, strengthening democracy and democratic institutions. And as we looked at the threats to our democracy, that's how we got to inequality. As we examined uh, the ways in which inequality impacts uh, democratic institutions, it impacts uh, the citizenry, uh, we felt that it was um, an imperative for us. And so, and as you said, I, I, we believe that because we know from the research um, the impact of inequality in a society. Uh, societies with growing inequality are societies with growing hopelessness among the citizenry. And no matter what continent you speak of, no matter what country, there are many, many examples and very good research uh, to demonstrate uh, that. And so, as you say, hope is the oxygen of democracy. And a democracy will atrophy where hopelessness grows. And so the work that we are doing, whether it is on economic opportunity for workers uh, or issues related to voting and civil and human rights, uh, racial justice, the reform of our criminal justice system, uh, our work around technology, uh, AI, and the impacts on um, vulnerable communities, especially communities of color. Um, it, our work, obviously, uh, on, on gender and uh, women's reproductive uh, health and rights. Uh, these are all sort of programmatic manifestations of how we see investing in social change. Thank you. So really, the, um, you can't separate the project of saving democracy really from solving problems of inequality. So solving those problems is important for moral reasons, but also because our, our very democracy depends on solving those problems. Absolutely. And, and I would like to say we focus on the three I's at Ford, on, on ideas, on institutions, and on individuals, on people. And in a democracy, social change requires um, the three I's. Right? I, I recall um, having lunch with Gloria Steinem once, and she said, you know, it was only when I was able to start an organization. I, I went to the Ford Foundation and I told them that I had this idea for an organization and I wanted to call it the Ms. Foundation. And I wanted to start a magazine called Ms. And, you know, until I was able to do that, I was, you know, just another activist out there leading a, a, a cause. But once I had an institutional anchor, um, I was able to uh, do something that was sustainable. Institutions in a democracy are essential. Uh, we have learned this. Uh, I can look back in our records. In the early 1960s, the Ford Foundation funded the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Uh, um, later on in the 60s, MALDEF, uh, um, other organizations, institutions to fight against voter suppression, other forms of discrimination. We just approved several million dollars of grants to the NAACP, Legal Defense Fund, MALDEF, those same organizations to fight voter suppression, 
uh, to fight forms of discrimination and bias. And so in a democracy, especially a multiracial, pluralist democracy like the US, which doesn't exist anywhere in the world, so just to be clear, <laughs> We don't exist anywhere in the world, if you haven't noticed, and, and, and it, is, it is the whole idea of the American experiment is a radical idea on its face, and it's partly why others in other parts of the world, in Europe and other parts of the world, have historically looked at America with, with awe, because they've never tried something like this. Uh, many of them would say there's no way something like this can work and be sustained. I think our commitment must be to proving them wrong. And in order to prove them wrong, we've got to have the institutions that recognize that justice is a contested idea. Right? It's a contested idea. And, and that's, in a society like the United States, that's understandable because different people's views of justice um, range. And your view, if you have been historically not allowed to have the full benefits of justice, you have one perspective. Um, if you've taken justice for granted, you have a different perspective. I was just in a, in a situation w talking with a grantee who is a public institution, a very prominent institution, and the leader of it sent an email out to their thousands of constituents saying, we encourage, we, this nonprofit, encourage you to vote. We encourage you to vote. Some of their donors didn't like that <laughs> because in the view of some of their donors, the kind of people who are their constituents who are primarily poor and people of color, I'm not sure some of those donors wished to see them vote. Mm -hmm. And so we, we don't see uh, our work on voting as uh, problematic or we, what's problematic about it is that we have to do it. But uh, the notion that every American should vote among the most patriotic duties, among the most noble callings of manifesting love of country and a belief in the system that anyone would seek to suppress that uh, is antithetical to our most conservative ideas of who we are. And it's regrettable for us at the Ford Foundation because we are so identified with efforts around, for example, voting rights, that we would be, um, we would be criticized for that. I think we should be, there are a lot of things we could be criticized for at the Ford Foundation. But I, I regret that there are some who would criticize us for, for that. Interesting. Your, your comment um, regarding the fact that sometimes donor interest or donor perspective isn't always aligned uh, mm. with some of the goals of the foundation um, kind of brings me to a question that was submitted by one of our student audience members. Um, uh, and that is, um, uh, is philanthropy a way for the rich to hide their money? Well, um, I don't think philanthropy is a way for the rich. I mean, I think if there's a critique, it's that philanthropy is a way the rich can greenwash their reputations. Um, I think that critique, which is real, uh, and has been with us since Carnegie and Rockefeller. I mean, it's really important. You know, Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller are revered men, and the names are the sort of 
globally known as the sort of gold standard of American philanthropy, as is Henry Ford. But it's very important to understand that during their lifetimes, these were despised men. I mean, John D. Rockefeller blew up an entire town looking for oil and never paid. I mean, and, I mean, because men like him, that's what they did, and that's what the system allowed. Um, and you know, in Pittsburgh, children were falling into iron pits. You know, twelve years old, dying in iron pits. Um, there was no OSHA. There was no system to protect them. Um, Andrew Carnegie never really spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, and that was a problem in terms of their reputations. And, and so this notion of using philanthropy to greenwash your reputation is not new. Um, and it is true that some have, but I don't think that most have. I think most people I know today who are wealthy truly want to try to make a difference in the world. And uh, some of them, the ones who really um, take, take a deeper analysis, um, are really, uh, really struggle, really struggle with, with some of these fundamental questions. Um, but I think wealth today, what is, what is even more amplified than it was in you know, John D. Rockefeller and Ida Tarbell's uh, day when Ida Tarbell wrote the horrific essays about John D. Rockefeller that sort of instantiated in the public's view that he was this horrible, horrible man. I think because of social media and because of inequality, um, the public is increasingly cynical about wealth mm -hmm. and wealthy people. And so it poses a greater challenge because there is greater demand in terms of accountability. Uh, there is growing scrutiny of, uh, of donors. Um, and there's less patience from the public sector and the, the private sector and the citizenry on, on where the money comes from and what it's being used for. Um, and, and that becomes a problem. And then we see things like, you know, billionaires putting money in donor advised funds and receiving the tax benefit without actually making grants um, that are sufficient, at least as, as they might if, it, if they had a, a requirement of some percentage to give away from that fund. So there are things like that that absolutely uh, make the public more cynical about philanthropy and wealth. Thank you. Now, staying with this theme of the economy, but, th but circling back a little bit more to the Ford Foundation's mm -hmm. vision, um, the Ford Foundation indicated earlier this year that it, it's plans to join forces with other foundations to initiate projects that will reimagine capitalism and apply a critical lens to free market assumptions. Can you tell us a little bit about this joint venture and the outcomes that you hope to see from that? Absolutely. Um, you know, Henry Ford II wrote a famous um, essay about the Ford Foundation, his frustration with the Ford Foundation in part. And one of the things he was frustrated by was the sense, his assessment that many of the staff of the foundation uh, did not understand the very system that made it possible for them to make grants and get a paycheck. Right? That there was a, a sense of almost naivete about the markets and about how business worked. And I think that that critique is fair. I think um, as someone who you know, spent a decade on Wall Street before running a nonprofit and then coming to philanthropy, 
I think there is a lot of naivete in, uh, in the world of philanthropy uh, about, about markets. Uh, now, there's no doubt that there's a lot of, uh, of narratives about exploitation, about uh, labor policy, about things that um, are negative about business and the markets that are accurate. But at the end of the day, we're capitalists at the Ford Foundation. And I actually believe that capitalism is the most effective way to organize an economy. I do not believe that the kind of capitalism we have today is producing the, the necessary shared prosperity we need for people to believe in capitalism. Right? So, so if what capitalism means to you is, and your introduction to really understanding capitalism is the private bank that calls you to make sure you're paying your student loan, um, you probably aren't thrilled about capitalism. <laughs> um, because in fact, if you've got a huge debt huge student loan burden when you leave college, it's not likely that you'll be able to do what the best of capitalism, which is to be an entrepreneur, right? To have the capital to actually start a business, uh, to have the capital to buy an asset, to create wealth, to aggregate over time um, from saving the chance to build wealth. And, and so I think we have to really think about this question of, of shared prosperity and of the mobility that comes from shared prosperity. My grandfather, who had a third grade education, was semi-literate. He worked as a porter in, a, in an oil company in Texas. And I mean, his job was, I mean, he was a porter. He cleaned the bathrooms, he cleaned, the, and he would, go around the executive floor and shine the shoes of the men. But he was an equity owner in that company because they had an old-fashioned profit-sharing plan. And when the oil company did well, every employee of the company got shares. And so when he retired, his equity in the company and his Social Security check allow him to live in old age with dignity. We no longer have those kinds of programs for workers, for frontline workers, for uh, middle wage and lower wage workers. And so I believe that's a problem. And there are design flaws in the way we have redesigned our system. So we had a system that was designed with benefits like that in place. Choices were made to redesign. And um, that has resulted now in fewer workers and actually uh, fewer Americans participating in the markets. Now, it's true, and some then say, well, uh, you're wrong because we have some majority of Americans who do own stock through, uh, or in the markets through some mechanism of their uh, defined contribution <laughs> or their, uh, their, 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 right, I mean, their voluntary uh, 401k or 401b. But, that is true, but 80% of the market caps are owned by less than 10% of the population. So it, is, it may be true that, you know, as I know, a member of my family, you know, who hasn't been able to save but a little bit, yes, in their voluntary program, she's got a few thousand dollars in the... Um, not nearly enough for retirement, of course, but the real 
concentration of who actually owns that today is in the hands of fewer Americans. And that's a problem. It's why we're working on the, this with, for example, uh, KKR, one of the large private equity firms. People say, well, what are you doing working with KKR? Well, in their portfolio companies, they are uh, instituting in, in, in this um, portfolio we're testing, they're instituting ownership. So every employee of every portfolio company gets stock. And, and we're gonna longitudinally see what happens. Is the company, are employees more productive? Are they more satisfied? Do they, is uh, retention um, less a problem in, this, in, in the, these portfolio companies? Because we have a hypothesis, and it is that the answer will be yes to all of that. Companies will be more productive. Workers will be more satisfied. They will stay at the job longer, um, et cetera. And, and so when you, know, you ask what is the foundation doing working on capitalism, um, it, it, this is why we think uh, we have to use our leverage, whether it's in our investment portfolio and we've allocated a billion dollars for impact investing, uh, or whether it's in partnering with the private sector to demonstrate the efficacy of ideas that generate more shared prosperity. So we're looking for those ideas and looking to put our philanthropic capital towards those ideas that do generate more shared prosperity and indeed make capitalism work for more people. Yeah, so really an inclusive economy kind of approach. Exactly. It's not to destroy the economy. But oh my it's goodness, to, it's it can't be to destroy the economy. I mean, we, you'd be naive. I mean, now some would say, well, you're naive to try this because the, the, the markets don't work this way. Well, markets, markets absolutely change and evolve from exogenous factors, from policy. I mean, many of the changes that have done harm to the idea of shared prosperity are because of policy. Yeah. Now, um, I'm also interested in knowing more about how the Ford Foundation hopes to influence its peers in the philanthropic space. And, and as one example, I wonder if you could speak to the ways in which the Ford Foundation is helping to advance racial equity. And do you feel that the, these efforts have the potential to catch on? elsewhere? Well, there's no doubt that uh, the challenge of race, as uh, every social observer from Alexis to Tocqueville to James Baldwin and beyond have said that this is the Achilles heel of our nation. And the challenge of, um, of holding the two narratives of this country, and it in some ways is manifest in just the sort of treatment of our founding fathers. Uh, I see Jefferson and Franklin and all of them as they, the ideas that they espoused, the, the way in which they constructed, uh, and the navigating all of the nuance was genius. I mean, it was absolutely, uh, there's never been anything like the creation of this country. And at the same time, they were deeply flawed and were unable and unwilling to actually fulfill the words that they wrote. I, I like to remind people that Thomas Jefferson wrote to his friend Samuel DuPont that the work of America is to build a just nation. Now, I was criticized in an in a essay because I opened it with reflecting on Jefferson before I got to Baldwin, and, but part of it was I was saying, you know, I want to hold Jefferson to his words. He said that. He said that's the work of America. So, yes, Thomas Jefferson, did not live those values. But he said those words and that that's the work of America. 
and I'm going to hold him to that. Right. <laughs> I'm going to, because, because that, that idea is an incredible, noble idea and a hard idea that he made even harder. And yet, they left, the, they left us the tools to fix what they were unwilling to fix. Mm -hmm. And we in this country have been unable to reconcile. We wish to live in a world of binaries. And the world is complicated. It is highly nuanced. And human beings are complicated. And we need nuance to be understood. And so I think the issue of race, because it is so central to our history, and so central to our identity, and that's the really hard part for some who, who don't want to hold on to both of those binaries on both sides. I mean, the, you know, the people who said, you know, how could you write this horrible racist slave owner, rapist, and I mean, all the things that, you know, how can you see him that way or write those things that Looked are not, nice, right? Yeah, right. We, we have to be willing to, 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 uh, to engage in the messiness of our history and not see it in this mythologized way. Um, and it's understandable, but it's, it's, it's propaganda. I mean, if you look at what, if you read what, literally what uh, Putin is putting out in rewriting Russian history, like some folks were sending me some things from that they're doing, they're literally rewriting what happened in the 20th century. They're like saying that like, what actually happened, the way the Berlin Wall fell, and all of this, like it actually didn't happen that way, that something else happened, and they're feeding it to the Russian people. That's really not good when <laughs> yeah. a, a political leaders, I mean, actually seek to rewrite history and change policy and feed it to the citizenry in an effort in the case of Russia to have a kind of propagandized hysteria among the citizenry against the Ukrainians, against the Americans, against the West because of their political need and, ex and the need for expediency to advance a political agenda that is about nationalism and a Russian identity that never existed in the first place. And that is a mythology of, of these hardliners in Putin that in no way reflects the reality of Russian history, which is an interesting history. I mean, which isn't, I mean, it's not as if, you know, there's an interesting history there. And so it's a lesson, I think, that this is what authoritarian, when, when again, we've seen it in Africa, we've seen it in Latin America, I mean, we've seen it, this is, this is sliding towards authoritarianism. And it is necessary to have the citizenry be miseducated because it serves a larger political agenda. Yes. Um, well, I think that those same dynamics are, are something we can speak to uh, within the United States as well. And so that brings me to the question of what role the Ford Foundation plays or hopes, aspires to play in bridging relationships among or across ideologies, categories of identity, 
should the Ford Foundation play a role in that? How, how do we think about some of these um, large chasms in terms of ideology and how they play out in the stability of our democracy and what is, how, how does Ford hope to address that? We absolutely have to engage in that if we're to work on our remit around democracy, strengthening democracy. I think the challenge uh, is how do we find uh, the bridge builders? Who are the bridge builders in a time when bridge building seems to be disincented? Um, when leaders who seek to build bridges across ideology, across perspectives, geographies, other identities, uh, are penalized for doing it. Uh, uh, how do we have a, how do we as a foundation invest in those bridge building institutions, the bridge building people, the bridge building ideas and innovations? Uh, we uh, are doing that in various ways but just to be very explicit in, in, in around some of our work around racial justice, because as you know, we have, um, we have a very significant investment in racial justice work, which is focused primarily on uh, the disadvantage and plight and injustices that especially people of color uh, have experienced over time in American history to this day, especially in systems like our criminal justice system, again, uh, which was designed to get us the outcomes we have, which is being an over-incarcerated nation with systems, with prisons that are populated primarily by black and brown men and poor whites. And so the issues of class and race play out in that system. But the reality is that inequality is affecting everyone in this country. And, and it's affecting some of us in good ways. Right? So if you, if you own real estate, if you were an equity investor, if you had a second home, I mean, all the things in, at the beginning of the pandemic, you were wealthier on the other side of the pandemic, if you had all of those. Uh, but that most Americans, including white Americans, do not have that. And, and so the inequality that we see in our society is affecting all of us. And so if you only take a racial justice lens to inequality. You're missing a really important dimension of inequality. And that's inequality that is happening to white people. Because we know from research, and again, this research is pre-pandemic research, and I think there is good data that is being processed now that, that I think will give us an update. But the research done by the two Princeton economists um, in the late uh, uh, 2010s, uh, showed for the first time that we had basically a generation of downwardly mobile white Americans. That life expectancy, wage stagnation, loss of asset, loss of assets, etc. That 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 was happening to a population that had never in the history of the United States had that happen. There were blips during the Depression, and so they were, but as a matter of mobility over time, white Americans have always been on the mobility escalator. And so what we have started to see is stagnation and reversal of progress, economic progress, of mobility. And so that also is impacting our democracy. Right? So, and so for, 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 for us, we have to 
then think about, all right, how do we engage on that question of inequality and for that population? And that really means working more in the heartland and in, in rural America. Um, it means looking at, at areas in, uh, of public health which we have not looked at. So for example, the impact of the opioid epidemic. It's had a huge impact on rural America and some of the uh, negative externalities manifest in rural communities. And so I think it's important and it's why we have now uh, committed new resources uh, to be able to address that issue and start to make grants to groups we may not have made grants to mm -hmm. in the past. The other thing I would say is for alliances with, with you know, what we would call conservative foundations. And because at the end of the day, uh, we need to believe in philanthropic pluralism. There are some foundations who absolutely do not agree with the Ford Foundation's uh, racial justice, inequality, support for marriage equality, and all the things that we have done over the years. Um, they still believe we have a right to exist. And we believe they have a right to exist. Mm -hmm. And that our philanthropic ecosystem is richer for it. And so we have to make sure that together, philanthropy, whatever our missions, our, is actually supporting the idea of philanthropy in America. Um, and that requires bridge building too. Um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about where technology plays into all of this and, and its role in addressing inequality. Um, and so one of this, this is a question submitted by one of our audience members, um, but I think it, it speaks to some of, the some of the cultural divide that you talk about and some of the disinformation that can be distributed um, uh, in, in ways that further that divide. And so the question asked by our audience member is, are online tools helpful or harmful? Will increasing access to the internet, for example, help or hinder the project of reducing inequality and strengthening democracy? I think the jury is out. I mean, I think we know that we were very fortunate because on the board of the Ford Foundation uh, for a number of years was Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who was the founder of the World Wide Web, and you know, today says that what was his dream um, has turned into a dystopian nightmare. Um, he had hoped and his idea was that the web would be a place where democracy, ideas, community would be built. Um, that that was the idea. That it would sort of be open source and that poor people, all people would have access um, and that governments would see the benefits of it and make it available to everyone. Um, there's no doubt that uh, this intersection of democracy and capitalism, the way it is played out uh, on the internet is highly problematic. If you care about justice uh, and opportunity for everyone, um, there's no doubt that the challenges of the analog world have migrated now to the digital world. And I'll just, just very simple examples. Uh, we have grantees who 10 years ago worked on predatory lending in minority neighborhoods. And we know this is a major issue uh, and where particular kinds of lenders targeted uh, black and brown neighborhoods for uh, high interest rates, uh, high fee mortgages. They used to do that by, uh, if you, in Harlem, for example, all the churches on Sundays when you came out, your cars had flyers on them from these people, or uh, all of the apartment houses, uh, buildings you'd go in in a black neighborhood in, in Bed-Stuy or in Queens would have the flyers and the, today, they can, those same predatory lenders, can develop a program and in a matter of hours, not reach just Harlem, but reach 
the entire metropolitan, black households and the entire metropolitan uh, New York City region with predatory products. And, and so how to uh, fortify the organizations whose missions it is to protect communities of color in that specific example from those predators in a digital um, is, is what we support. So our work is really both directly to some of the civil rights organizations, human rights organizations, to do everything from uh, security and encryption and the kinds of just uh, plumbing and infrastructure um, to research on, uh, for example, the pernicious impact of, of AI on um, decisions by parole boards. Right? And so now we have companies who, who are making tremendous profits selling AI to state parole systems to make decisions about who gets parole and who doesn't. Uh, we have um, particular, I mean, ways in which, uh, ways in which data is being, uh, are being collected on specific communities that can really do harm to those communities if that data is shared, and it is shared. In fact, it's monetized. And so we are supporting a, a new generation. When I said about innovations, there are new organizations that have come about that are, that are necessary in this digital world who themselves are technologists. One of the things that we have supported is the creation of a new field called public interest technology. In the 1960s, the Ford Foundation supported the field of public interest law. If you, were, I was trained as a lawyer. If you, there was no such thing as public interest law. I mean, when I went to law school, everyone knew you call yourself a public interest lawyer. There were legal clinics. There were. It was none of that existed before the 1960s. And in the 1960s, the Ford Foundation supported the transformation of the legal curricula and lawyering in America that really helped to change the landscape. Everything from uh, pro bono service. I mean, if you were at any big law firm, in New York at least, you know, you were supposed to bill 5% of your hours for pro bono work. Um, we need, in the technology space, we need the, the, the engineers, the CS majors, the people doing, uh, that kind of work and that kind of uh, a, a credential, thinking not just about going to work for Google uh, or, or Amazon, but saying, could I go to work for uh, Planned Parenthood or the ACLU or the Federalist Society or whomever, and take my, my skills as a technologist and use them for the public good, in the service of the public. Uh, and to companies, the same way we worked with law firms and others to say, all right, can you, Google, Amazon, allow your technologists to spend 10%, 5% of their hours working on public interest projects, not just on new products for the company, but working on public interest. And we've created, we've supported the creation of a network in which I'm happy that UM is one of the universities uh, that is a member um, of top universities with engineering schools, um, computer science programs. And I think we're, it's now over 40, um, and it's called the Public Interest Technology University Network. And that group is working on everything from um, helping universities uh, raise chairs and professorships in public interest technology to support for fellowships, um, congressional fellows, for example. Because if you saw the almost comedic yet tragic hearings uh, during uh, in the in 2000s with Mark Zuckerberg and the other leaders in technology, and when they were being interrogated by the Senate, 
and online, people were laughing and making, because they were laughing because the senators were asking questions about their mouse and about these basic <laughs> things. And the reason the senators were doing that was because there was no one sitting behind them in any other phase of American life. If that had been a group of bankers, sitting behind the senators would have been people who went to Harvard Business School just like Jamie Dimon and who were just as smart as him but decided to serve the public and they'd be passing index cards saying, no, he's wrong. This is what you need to ask. And I've seen how that works in every in the environment, on children's welfare, whatever it is. You've got these experts sitting behind the senator passing him or her notes. And it's a whole, it's, that's, the way, that's the way it works. On technology, there's no one sitting behind them. There's no one sitting behind them working for the public. Um, it is truly um, no one's at home. And so we have supported a Congressional Fellows Program to bring uh, students who are working on BA, BS and, and Masters and some PhDs to be support. And it's great because they are now moving from what was a one or two year fellowship to actually going on the staff of, and we're already seeing the impact in terms of policy. When you have technology expertise and you, it's not, um, I mean, because basically the public interest is what the private sector has told us it is. Because we've not been able, we don't have the capacity in government to actually uh, define what the public interest is in this new digital world. And so we've just basically said, you know, Facebook has told us. I mean, they literally have told us what sliver of this pie the public has a purview over. And everything else is, is owned by the private and is completely monetizable and completely um, without recourse in terms of the public's ability to really um, hold them accountable. So let's talk a bit then about the role of young people in the solution to some of this. And you, you mentioned the importance of inspiring young people to, um, to seek out careers or, or pro, bon pro bono activities uh, for the public good. Um, and a, a number of our audience members and people who are involved in, in uh, organizing this lecture as being in the School of Social Work, these are young people who want to make a difference in the world. They want to make change in the world. Speaking from outside our profession, I know that you're not yourself a social worker, but sitting from outside our profession in a very powerful position, what advice do you have for future, future, future social workers who are starting out in this work and who want to make a difference? Well, I have a very high regard for social workers. My, uh, one of my heroes uh, was Whitney Young. Okay. And uh, Whitney Young, who was head of the National Urban League and was this iconic African-American leader who tragically uh, died too young. Um, but he always took such pride in the fact that he was a social worker. And he moved in circles uh, where he was a rarity, right? where uh, he was often with business people or uh, public policy uh, or lawyers. And he was very proud of the fact that he was a social worker because I think uh, what it takes to be a social worker, particularly in a time when uh, there is so much in the wake of a pandemic, so much pain and grief and uh, anguish over the state of the world and in turn the state of person's life, especially someone who is lower income, whose identity may be different, who uh, feels marginalized. And the reality of our country is that there are more and more people who fit into those categories. And more and more of those people, uh, the the burden of, of how a society addresses that rests on the shoulders of social workers. And so it is uh, 
very, um, I mean, again, when I get back to what are the noble callings, uh, when I think about the uh, historic uh, speech that you say, uh, said, uh, your reference to the, the famous speech here that uh, President Kennedy gave on the steps of the Michigan Union, uh, I think today we have to, what would, what would you say today about service and serving and uh, who would be the focus and what communities would he uh, call us to and call you to serve uh, given the pain and the trauma that we see so rampant in our country. My advice, which uh, I don't pretend to have the fortitude uh, I, I do think, though, that we need to bring social work and other disciplines closer together. And I think this nice man is going to take my lab. Oh. Thank you very much. I think the, the uh, discipline of social work is really critical and essential, and how this credential and this training prepares people to work in interdisciplinary systems. So for example, going back to the question of, um, of technology, I was on a panel with a very well-known billionaire founder of a, a major tech company, and, and the moderator, we were talking about some large social challenge, and he said to the moderator, well, what we, what we need is to get a group of, uh, of engineers in a, in a conference room for a weekend, and, and they can solve this. <laughs> and, you know, I, I sort of sat there as I, you know, we all, and, and I was like, all right, is the moderator going to say something? Or, <laughs> and so then I was like sitting there, and I said, well, I would agree with you if in the conference room there was a social worker, a political scientist, maybe a lawyer, a, a poet. I mean, maybe then we might have a chance, but if you actually think that a computer scientist is going to solve that problem, I mean, that's part of what we're dealing with now. Um, and so I guess my plea is, and to you as a dean and an educator, Dean Angel, is how do we build more interdisciplinary engagement? Because the training of a social worker is a critical input to problem solving in ways that are very broad with policy implications and, and so forth. And so I'm just, and I think this is one of the real challenges we've learned, for example, with our work around public interest technology. And, and that is how universities, the way universities are designed, discourages the kind of interdisciplinary aspirations I'm speaking of. And so, you know, I think of, and probably too simplistic, but I think of everything through a lens of systems and design. And um, I just, I think of, I think about just about everything. I was having, I was having lunch with the president of, of Harvard at some point and we were, and he said, oh my goodness, you're the president of Ford Foundation, you know, what would Henry Ford think? And I said, well, you know, you're the president of Harvard you're Jewish, this place wasn't designed for you. Just like the Ford, I mean, it wasn't, and he said, no, you're absolutely right. This was, it wasn't designed. Every, and everything that in our society was designed with something and somebody and who's to benefit in mind. And often the sort of antibodies that emerge of resistance to change is a design issue. Right? It is, it is, and so, to my mind, so much of, of 
whether it is the university was designed in a particular way, uh, or the justice system, or the education system, all of these ways in which we now need to intervene and rejigger things. And universities are hard. I don't have to tell you and many of you here, universities are hard, and I've learned this, trying to work with a few uh, on redesigning curricula. So you want engineers who can be, be more, uh, have, have greater breadth uh, in their understanding of the world um, beyond that one three-hour ethics class. And, and yet, the engineering faculty is dead set against that. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are stakeholders in the status quo and the antibodies, and they, they have a great argument that, that the training that a competent engineer needs to have does require that. Right? So I don't, I don't, I'm not dismissing uh, their argument for the status quo, but we've got to figure out a way to think more innovatively about redesign. It doesn't mean, in no way am I saying dismantling, throwing it out, any of that. I'm simply saying the problems of the 21st century cannot be solved with systems that were designed for the 19th century. Um, and so how do we get there is mm -hmm. the challenge. Yeah. Um, one of the things we often say in social work is that we try to prepare students not only for the jobs that exist today, but the jobs that are going to exist in the future that we don't even know what they are yet. And I think that that interdisciplinarity that you talk about is very key to that. One current intersection that we are really interested in the University of Michigan School of Social Work right now is ways to harness the power of the arts in the pursuit of social justice and particularly anti-racism. And I know that you are a huge champion of the arts and that the Ford Foundation has been a huge champion of the arts. And so what ideas might you offer us in considering initiatives at this intersection? Well, it's really interesting because uh, I, when we were first reevaluating and making big changes at Ford and I was and, you know, the first thing we are keeping is the arts. I mean, there were some people who were absolutely, you know, why is he so such a zealot around the arts? Um, and I, I like to think that uh, when we worked on the Detroit bankruptcy, uh, a lot of people were obsessing about the DIA, which of course is the great museum that is an ex extraordinary jewel. I mean, that Detroit has this world-class museum. Uh, I'll never forget at seeing, uh, being at the Kimball in Fort Worth for the great Caravaggio show that had been uh, in Italy and New York, and then it went to Fort Worth. But, you know, the greatest painting uh, of the show, you know, the label said, you know, on loan from the Detroit Institute of the Arts. I mean, mm -hmm. this museum has just an extraordinary, extraordinary collection history. But when the bankruptcy happened, as its trustee Cynthia Ford knows, the city was technically the owner of the collection. And the whole question of how to protect the collection, because it was important, because the pensioners, the civil servants, were not going to receive, as a result of the malfeasance of the managers of the, their pensions, their pensions. And so to me, it was a fundamental issue of justice. It was such an injustice that, that these hardworking people who had served the city and had been the bus driver and the person in the DMV and the, that they weren't going to, was an enormous injustice. But I, what I loved is sort of the intersection of the work that we were all doing, all of the foundations were doing, because it was about art and about justice. And it was really the first time in my 
my head that I could wrap my wrap around a theory around this intersection of art and justice. And some of it was, I mean, that was just sort of a metaphor in my mind, but, but some of it was just the research on what, what learning the arts and humanities does. I mean, we know the research around, for children, around empathy, around um, an ability to uh, put yourself in the shoes of other people. Um, of uh, curiosity and, and listening, um, that all of this is what comes from the art in part. And, but all of that is needed because ultimately, so much of what you get is, is empathy. And a population of, uh, of Americans who are more empathetic, I think generates an environment of an America where there is more justice. Because you can't get to justice without empathy. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm just a strong believer in it. And I also would observe that there are times when we see people in our society who say the most inhumane things about other human beings who use degrading language to talk about other Americans, other people, dehumanize people, demean people. Whenever I see someone like that, I know that individual has never experienced a beautiful poem. Mm -hmm. They have never sat in the DIA in front of those Diego Rivera murals and pondered the messages in those murals. They have never encountered beautiful literature and sat in a theater and listened to the words of Hamilton. I mean, they could not mm -hmm. have had those experiences and be so cruel and think in such inhumane terms about other human beings. And so that's why the arts matter. Um, and it's, it's why all of you as parents and grandparents, I mean, it's why you take your kids to the museums. It's why you, you take them to, because you know. It's not because you, you know, got to figure out what to do with their time. It's because you know as parents, as grandparents, is that like your kids will be better kids. They will be smarter, they will be more open, they will see the world and not just their small, and they will see their place in the world. Um, and they will not necessarily, if they're seeing museums that are 21st century museums, they won't just see themselves represented. And they won't just, as a result, because when you just see yourself represented in museums, you tend to center yourself mm -hmm. because that's what you see. And when you see in museums other people represented and you're a child and you see other people, you actually center a much broader panoply of, of people, of humanity than just yourself. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing for our democracy. So an amplifier of empathy. So. Now, in social work, we're sort of in the business of empathy. That's kind of, that's one of our fundamentals. Um, and so my final question really speaks to um, the headset of someone who is an empath. Um, because social change, trying to bring forward social change, as you know, is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And so people who lead from the heart uh, become disheartened. So how, how, what is your advice about how people who lead from the heart keep themselves restored and grounded in troubled times and keep themselves whole so they can engage in this work? And maybe you can talk about how you do that. Well, it is, it is really hard. Because on any given day, it is easy to be 
depressed, dejected, disgusted, disoriented, uh, and yet uh, we are resilient. And I think people who choose social work as a pursuit, as a career, as a profession, have within them a resilience. For me personally, I, because I experience all of those emotions, but I am reminded of the people who came before me and reminded of my privilege. I think about Fannie Lou Hamer. I mean, Fannie Lou Hamer was beaten, was sterilized against her will, was treated in the most horrific ways in her own community in Mississippi. But she believed in America. And she knew in her lifetime the thing she was fighting for, she would never see. And yet she believed. And I can think of so many people. And for me, that's what I draw from. I draw from Langston Hughes's Let America Be America again. And this brilliant man living on 126th Street in Harlem, couldn't find a job, poor and yet with a dazzling intellect and an ability to write poetry. I mean, he wrote this poem, Let America Be America Again, in the first stanza, Let America Be America Again. America never was America to me. And yet he ends in the last stanza, but oh yes, someday America will be. It was his love letter to this country, mm. in spite of the fact that this country did not love him. And so as I think about my, my situation, my privileged perch, my nice apartment in Manhattan, my nice office every day at the Ford Foundation, and all of the privileges I have, and I reflect on their lives, I have no right to be depressed, dejected, demoralized. I have to be motivated and should be motivated every day because of my reflecting on them to suit up because they suited up every day and the suits didn't come from Ralph Lauren. They <laughs> had to suit up in real time suit up yeah. without the privileges and perks that those of us today who feel a little discouraged have at our. And so that's how I think about my own life. And I think about those moments when I turn on the news or I read something or I'm on Twitter and I just can't believe what I'm witnessing. Um, we have to have those people, those memories, that history uh, that encourages us to do the work of justice in the world. Well, that is a beautiful place. beautiful place for us to bring our program to a close. And so I want to thank you, President Walker, for your time with us today. And I want to thank all of you for being here. Um, as just a couple of 
housekeeping finishers, today's program has been recorded and should be available to view within a week. If you are receiving continuing education hours, please be sure and check in with Aaliyah from our con continuing education office on your way out. And while this concludes the formal part of our program, I invite you all to stay for some light refreshments. And I hope that today's program will inspire you to ask questions, to reflect on the impact that you wish to make in the world. Thank you. <laughs>